Um, I would like to introduce to you Kimberly Kilby and Carla Ersey. Um, they are both from the Office of Civil Rights out of the Federal Department of Education. Um, they are the trainers this afternoon. Um, they are out of the Cleveland office, I believe. And at this point, I'm going to turn over the information and presentation to them. Please remember your um, questions can be written down on the blue cards on your table. All right, thank you. Hi, so I'm Kimberly Kilby, and um, Carla Ussery and I are going to split up the presentation. I did want to say this is normally a two hour presentation. We're going to do it in an hour and 10 minutes today because it's being videotaped, and those were the requirements. So we'd like to answer questions, but we're going to ask you to hold your questions until the end so that we can get through the presentation for the people who are going to be watching this on the video. At the table, we place some blue index cards for y'all to write down your questions as you think of them. At the end of the presentation, we are more than happy to answer your questions. You know, and we'll take if you want to raise your hands and ask questions, or if you want to us to um, just read questions from the index cards, we're happy to do either one. But we are kind of, so it's kind of unusual for us, but please just hold your questions until the end. Okay, thank you. And I will let you know that um, I am profoundly hard of hearing, and I have recently gotten a cochlear implant that I'm adjusting to. So just if I, if somebody read one um, at the end, Kimberly may have to let me know. I may have to run around or something so that I can hear you. But hopefully that will work. Okay. Um, and again, as Kimberly said, this is a much longer presentation generally, so we will try to keep moving through and, and getting through it for you. Um, we are with the Office of Civil Rights, as you said, which is a part of the federal government, the part of the Federal Department of Education. We abbreviated OCRs for Office of Civil Rights, so we say OCR, that's what we mean. It's just where we work. Um, Kimberly and I are both attorneys. Uh, I was a high school teacher, English and French, for a number of years before I started losing my hearing, and then became an attorney and worked for a publisher and then worked for this department. And Kimberly was a, um, an attorney with the Department of Justice and then worked in fair housing before she came to us. Um, our agency enforces various civil rights laws throughout the country. Okay, now we get to be challenged and figure out how to, how to click this thing. Is this it? Ah, okay. I never said I was a tech person here. <laughs> Thank you. This one? Thank you. Um, I was a teacher long enough ago that we were doing overheads and out PowerPoint. So this is, this is new. I can do it, but it's not normal for me. Um, our agency is charged by Congress with enforcing federal civil rights laws in educational settings. So we enforce laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, disability, and age. Usually we would discuss that, but I'm going to move past. Today we are focusing solely on disability discrimination. Um, our office is in Cleveland, and we handle all enforcement cases in Ohio and Michigan. You wouldn't think that would be enough, but there are tons of schools and in colleges in Ohio and Michigan, so we're very busy. Um, we have agencies, uh, offices all around the country, but we're in Cleveland. The first thing I wanted to talk about is a little bit about the laws that we are enforcing. Um, if you know anything about the history of disability in this country, we did not do a very good job for many, many, many years. People with disabilities were institutionalized in really horrific circumstances. They were not allowed to attend public schools. They were not allowed to attend colleges and universities solely because they had a disability. Congress at some point in society realized that was not a good idea. It wasn't just. It also wasn't economically. It didn't make sense because you didn't educate people. They weren't likely to be able to work and take care of themselves and pay taxes. So at some point, the federal government passed these laws to ensure that people with disabilities had an equal opportunity to an education and an equal opportunity to participate in society, which makes perfect sense now, but back then was kind of Revolutionary. Um, Section 504 is the first law and the main law we'll be talking about today. It's part of a law called the Rehabilitation Act. It was passed in 1973. 
And it prohibits discrimination by any institution that gets federal financial assistance, and specifically federal funding from the Department of Education. So if the Department of Education is going to give you Title I money or any, any kind of funding, it's going to want a school district to sign and assure that it's not going to discriminate, because it's not going to give any money to people who are discriminating. It's not going to happen. Um, after that was passed in 1990, the government passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, which you may have heard of because there's been some cases about golfing and um, professional golfing and other things. Um, we enforce a piece of that called Title II, and that extends the prohibition against disability to public institutions. So public state and local governments can't discriminate, public schools can't discriminate. Both laws apply to Columbus, Section 504, because you get federal financial assistance from my department, and Title II because you're a public school system. Section 504 is intended specifically for education, so it has a lot of very specific provisions that are education and school related. Title II, because it applies to all state and local governments, including courthouses and libraries, it isn't so education specific, but it still covers you. It's still in effect. There is a third law called the IDEA, which you may have heard of, I hope. Yes? Um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. It's enforced by the Department of Education, but not by my little piece of it, OCR. So we're mentioning it now, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but we're not going to address that specifically because that's not what we do. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act was passed to fund special education, to provide money for students with disabilities who need special ed. Section 504 is a civil rights law. It is supposed to ensure equal opportunity for people with disabilities to participate in a district's program. It does not have any specific funding attached to it. It just says if we give you any money for anything, you can't discriminate. IDEA does actually provide some funding. I know not enough. Everybody always, you know, never enough. But it does provide some money. So people tend to know much more about IDEA because they get money. And so it becomes much more relevant. 504 then is not as well known, but it still applies. We'll talk a bit more about the differences later. I just wanted to mention that it existed. OK. So what do you need to know about Section 504 and Title II? The first is not even mentioned in the presentation, but it may be relevant for you to know that we are only going to talk about elementary and secondary education today. But Section 504 covers a much broader range. It covers preschool education. The rules are different, but it covers them. It covers college. So if you're a counselor and you have students with disabilities who may be going to college later, they really need to understand Section 504. Because once they graduate and go to college, IDEA no longer exists. It's gone. So all the rules that covered them when they're in your schools are gone. They need to know 504 and Title II. Unfortunately, today we don't have time to discuss how that's different. What I'm saying today does not apply generally to colleges. But there's information on our website about that. Or we can come back at another time if Columbus wants us to, to talk about that. But students absolutely need to know the post-secondary part if they're going to college. Because IDEA does no longer cover them. Okay. Another thing that it covers is employment. So all of you. As district employees, if you become disabled or you have a disability, you have rights under Section 504 and Title II. You're protected from discrimination. You have a right to reasonable accommodation. If you need it for disability, there are rights that accrue to you. The last thing it covers is physical accessibility of facilities. So this is where you get ramps and um, braille signage, things like that. As far as what you need to know yourself, I'm looking for my water bottle. I don't see it. That's not mine. Excuse me. OK. Because, it is, because 
Students with disabilities were excluded from public school. The first thing these laws do is require districts to locate and notify people with disabilities and their parents that they have a right to a public education and they can come to school. Because when these laws were passed, everybody was home. They didn't know they could come. So at the beginning, districts literally went door to door, knocking. Do you have somebody with a disability living here? Do you know of anybody who's not going to school? Nowadays, because most people know that people with disabilities can go, it's more reasonable efforts. So people have to put notices on their websites that they don't discriminate and that people with disabilities have a right to, to come. They should be put in their recruitment materials, in their handbooks, in their newsletters, those kind of things. And that suffices, because most people know that people with disabilities can come to school now. Okay. It's called child find under IDEA, but we don't have that nice little name under 504. Same responsibility. The second thing that a district has to do is to provide a free and appropriate public education to every student with a disability in the school district's jurisdiction, regardless of the nature of the disability or how severe it is. This is called a FAPE. So if I goof and say FAPE, we love abbreviations where I work, so I'm likely to say that. It just means you have to provide a free and appropriate public education. Within the jurisdiction generally goes by residence, so it's where the child lives. If they live in a particular district, that district is responsible for providing them with an appropriate education. If they are homeless, same thing. Where do they live? If they're in a shelter, it's the school district where the shelter is located. They live under a bridge somewhere permanently, that's the district in which that location is. So people, kids who are homeless also have a right to an education, and children with disabilities have a right to an education. If you participate in schools of choice and things like that, that may vary depending on the state law, which district has responsibility for what. Okay, so what does it mean to give a FAPE? a free appropriate public education. Um, the first part's pretty easy. Free means free. <laughs> um, if there are any charges related to disability, then you cannot pass those charges along to the student or to the parents. It is the part of the cost of doing business for the district. So if the, district ne if the student needs a braille note-taking device, you can't charge the parents for that. If a student needs a um, sign language interpreter, or needs an aid or a tutor, something like, something like that, then it's not a cost that can be passed along to the parents. You may charge them for any fees you regularly charge everybody. So if you have a student activity fee, they pay that too. If you have a fee to participate in a particular sport, they pay that too. What you can't do is add on the additional cost of the disability. So if you're charging everybody because you're taking a field trip and if you want to go, you have to pay $20, that's fine. But if you needed a special bus because they need an accessible bus, you can't charge the child for the accessible bus. You can charge them the fee everybody else pays, and that's all. The district is part of the cost of doing business otherwise. Okay, appropriate is more difficult. An appropriate education is one appropriate for that individual child depending on their disability. So an appropriate education could be regular education with everybody else, could be special education, could be education with related aids and services like a sign language interpreter or an occupational therapist or whatever that might be. It is designed to meet that student's individual needs so it's not like everybody who has ADHD gets this. Everybody ha who has a learning disability gets this. It's what does that particular child need to get an appropriate education. Um, I can use myself as an example. When I go to legal education trainings and I tell them I'm profoundly hearing impaired, oh, don't worry, we have a sign language interpreter. It's all taken care of. I don't sign. So individually, that means nothing to me when there's a sign language interpreter standing up there. I use something called CART, Computer Assisted Real-Time Transcription. They bring in a court reporter with one of the little five key fancy machines that I don't know how they work, and 
that person takes down everything that's being said. And there's special software now. They don't have to have the big, long tape. And the software translates it and sends it to a laptop sitting right there, and I read it. And as every somebody's talking, I'm reading. And that's how I manage speakerphone, call, speakerphone calls and lectures and anything I can't hear. That works for my individual needs. So that's what you have to determine. What is the child's individual need? Not, they have ADHD, they get this. OK, how much do you have to do? You have to provide them with the same level of education everybody else gets. I hate to say that because, of course, any parent wants the absolute best for their child. And we try to give them that. But you give them the same level of education that the general education children get. So if you're in a district where they spend $80,000 a year per child and they're getting everything under the sun, that's the sort of education. If you're not in that kind of district, you give them an appropriate education compared to everybody else. OK. One thing to note for districts, one thing that many people don't understand, if you notice the definition includes regular or special ed, it's not common, but if a child who is classified under Section 504 and not under IDEA, for whatever reason, needs special education to get an appropriate education, they are entitled to have it. And that's sometimes not understood. It's rare, but it does happen. OK, the process. How does this work? I apologize in advance, because you probably want a lot of very specific rules. I usually bring a copy of the Section 504 regulation with me. It's about an eighth of an inch thick total. IDEA, if you've ever seen it, is like that. Um, IDEA has every possible, you know, everything. 504 doesn't have that. It's very general. And so we do the best we can to tell you what you have to do, but we can't tell you. You must have this person, this person, and this person on the team because the regulation doesn't say that. So we do the best we can telling you what we can do. OK, the process, three steps. Identification, evaluation, and placement. As a former math major, I fought against this slide because it's a Venn diagram and how those overlap should mean something. They don't, okay? <laughs> Somebody wanted to put a picture and they put it like that and I said, but it means, it didn't matter, it's the government, we want a picture, fine. Um, it doesn't overlap like that, it just means there are three areas we're going to talk about, that's all. Okay, first thing, in order to provide a FAPE then, a free appropriate public education, you need to know who might have a disability and what do they need. Makes sense. So you're going to have to individually evaluate any child who, because of a disability, might need special services, might need services. You should be on. Still not. Ah. Hmm.
just he just replaced them. If we have to. There was a mic down in my room. Is it working now? I'm so sorry. Now you have to listen to me. I shouted at you, and now you get it again. I'm so sorry. OK, we'll try it again. Identification, evaluation, and placement are the three things we're going to talk about. Please don't pay attention to the fact that it's a Venn diagram, because it doesn't mean anything. OK, if you're going to provide a FAPE, you have to know whether or not somebody has a disability and might need services. The district has an affirmative duty to evaluate any student when it suspects that person might have a disability and might need services. You cannot wait for a parent to ask. Your people have to be able to identify whether or not somebody might have a disability. So please inform your teachers, your guidance counselors, your people who take the paperwork up front that they need to be on the lookout for anyone who might need to be referred for an evaluation. Um, if parents ask for an evaluation, you may evaluate if you suspect a disability. If you really don't, nothing that the teachers have seen or the parent has told you or the parent has given you in documentation indicates disability at all, you don't have to evaluate, but you must then inform them of their due process rights, which Kimberly will talk about later. Um, what OCR does is look to see whether you should have known the child might have a disability. So if the parent has given you paperwork from University of Cincinnati, or Cincinnati Hot Children's Hospital and it says the person has bipolar disorder and this and that, you've probably been put on notice that the person might have a disability and you should do something. If they've given you nothing like that and they just say, well, I th he's having trouble, that probably not enough. So it just depends. Um, I'd like to spend one minute on interventions. Um, it, interventions are great things and people do try them. If any regular education student is having trouble and you want to try interventions to see if it helps them, great. But the minute you suspect a child might have a disability, you must evaluate. You can't put them into an intervention land for several months to see what happens. Interventions could be part of an evaluation for a couple weeks to see how persons respond and so forth. But if you suspect disability, you must evaluate. There's no Let's try interventions for four months, and if they do fine, we'll never evaluate. That's not what the law says. So be careful with that one. You can form it as part of an evaluation, but not in place of and not delaying an evaluation. OK, when does it have to happen? Sorry. I tend to forget the clicker, having been, as I said, an overhead person who usually could, used to be able to see it. OK, you have to evaluate before the child's initial placement in regular or special education as a student with a disability. Because, remember, you need to know what the person's individual needs are. So if you don't evaluate until after you've placed them, you're not going to be meeting their needs because you won't know what they are. The purpose of the evaluation, then, is to first determine if the child actually has a disability, as defined by the law. And if so, I mean, they may not, but if so, what are their individual education needs? What do we need to be doing for that child? So those are the two tasks when you go to evaluate someone. Are they a person with a disability? And if so, what are their individual needs? What do we need to be serving to give them an appropriate education? Um, Section 504 evaluation procedures are supposed to ensure that you don't misclassify students so that you've identified them with the wrong disability, so that you've unnecessarily labeled them as having a disability when they don't, you know, they're just having some difficulty like any child could have, that they're not incorrectly placed because you've used the wrong testing or you've used the wrong criteria. So you're supposed to be evaluating appropriately. The biggest mistake we see districts make, I think, two things. One, a student's parent comes in. My child is having such trouble, I want him on a 504 plan. 
okay, we'll put him on a plan, what do you want? That subverts the whole process because you're supposed to evaluate to find out if the person with a disability first and what do they need because of their disability. It may not be what mom or dad thinks they need. It, you are responsible for providing an appropriate education, so you have to know, not just what they want. Um, this, the problem with, and the second thing is, a district evaluates under IDEA, they, then they aren't covered under IDEA. They don't meet it. Okay, we'll put them on a 504 plan. You know, without doing a 504 evaluation to see whether they qualify under 504 and what their needs are. Because an IDEA evaluation is different. The criteria are different. So the problem with doing that is, number one, you've conveyed legal rights. If you put them on a 504 plan, you're saying the district believes that child has a disability under 504 and has these rights. And secondly, if you do it without an evaluation, you don't know what that child needs. <laughs> you're just doing what mom or dad says. And that's not necessarily going to be a fake, be the right kind of education. Excuse me a moment. Okay. Got it. Okay, first thing you have to do then is determine whether or not the child has a disability. Someone's been referred to you, you're doing an evaluation, you have to know if they're disabled. There are several ways you can be disabled under 504. I'm going to talk about right now only the one that can get a child's services and a 504 plan. If we have time later, we'll talk about the others. But this is the one you're doing the evaluation for. Okay? In that definition then, you need to decide if the child has an impairment, a physical or mental impairment, that substantially limits one or more major life activities. That's the 504 definition of disability, right there. It has three parts. So you're looking at, does the child have an impairment? Does the impairment limit a major life activity? And how much does it limit it? Is it substantial? And we're gonna talk about each one of these so you can see what you have to decide. This is an individualized inquiry based on every person, specific person. Okay, first, does the child have an impairment? Okay, this is a shorty definition. There's a much longer one in the regulation that talks about all these bodily systems. Basically, you are looking to see is does the child have a physical, physiological condition that affects a bodily system or any mental or psychological disorder? So that's an impairment. Do they have something affecting some kind of physical or mental condition? Um, the biggest thing districts miss here is the, is the psychological. Districts kind of get the physical. They have difficulty walking or breathing or hearing or seeing. But somebody can come in with a, def, with a diagnosis of severe depression and 504 never enters the picture. It should. A psych, psychological condition also counts. Learning disabilities count. Developmental delay count. Mental stuff as well as physical. Okay, it is not an exhaustive list. This is just the basic thing you look for. Impairment is usually not where the problem is. The next part then, once you know whether or not they have some kind of physical condition affecting them, or mental condition, is to see whether it limits a major life activity and limits it substantially. Major life activities, we got lucky the regulation actually defines it. This is not exhaustive, though. There can be other things that count. The first column is what used to be in Section 504 in Title II originally. So limitations, major life activities, things like caring for yourself, performing manual tasks, walking, seeing, hearing, speaking, breathing, learning, working. That again wasn't exhaustive, but because of what was going on in case law and in courts, courts were kind of fearing that they were going to be overwhelmed with disability cases, so judges were being very narrow about who they said was protected by these laws. 
So Congress stepped in, and in 2008, they amended Section 504 and Title II, and they changed the definition of disability. One thing they did was to say it should be broadly construed. You should be trying to be inclusive and not cut people out. So they gave additional major life activities. Eating, sleeping, standing, lifting, bending, reading, etc. Again, this isn't all. If you could have reproductions and all on there, that's been considered on a bunch of other stuff. The biggest thing districts have to be careful of is not to focus only on learning. It can be any of these major life activities the condition limits to constitute a disability, not just learning. So diabetes may or may not affect your ability to learn. It certainly affects your ability to eat and care for yourself, so you may be a person with a disability, even though it doesn't necessarily affect your learning. Okay, another thing that was added in 2008 was that a major life activity could be the operation of major bodily functions. The reason for this is that conditions such as diabetes and irritable bowel and things like that, they may not limit your ability to do a particular thing. Like somebody with diabetes that's well controlled can run and do a bunch of stuff, you know, probably everything. But it is affecting their endocrine system. It affects a major bodily system. So that could qualify them as having a disability. Another thing that is not on this slide that I wanted to mention is that districts often miss medical conditions as things that could constitute 504 disabilities. Diabetes, epilepsy, irritable bowel, Crohn's disease, all sorts of physical conditions. Because they're not so necessarily linked to learning, people forget about them. And they just come in and the nurse puts them on a health plan. Under 504, if you have an impairment that limits a major life activity like this, and does it substantially, that's somebody you should evaluate and see if they need a 504 plan. So someone with diabetes may need a 504 plan so that the teachers know how to do the glucose testing or the cafeteria workers know to give the carb counts. When somebody goes on a field trip, they've got somebody properly trained in case there's a diabetic emergency. That's all sort of things that should be 504 issues and on a 504 plan. You can call it a health plan, we don't care what you call it but you must evaluate anybody with that kind of condition that might constitute a disability and decide if they're qualified under 504. Okay, last question. They have an impairment. It affects a major life activity. The last thing you have to do is decide if it does it substantially. This is not defined, I hate to say this. The regulation is not nice and it does not tell you what substantial means. The original court cases, they went to the dictionary, <laughs> and it said like, major, not minor, significant, not insignificant. Um, courts got really bad and started saying it had to be really severe or you can't do it at all to constitute substantial. Congress stepped in in 2008 and said that's too much, but they never told us what it actually was. <laughs> So until courts say more, we really don't know, but you can kind of use the major significant, something more than just affected, but not impossible to, you know, can't do it at all. We really can't give you much information on that. I did want to mention two things that aren't on the slide. One is that people ask us whether you consider mitigating measures, things that people do to lessen the effects of the disability. So my cochlear implant, now it's a prosthetic, so it's not, but let's say it, when I wore a hearing aid, I used the hearing aid to lessen the effect of my hearing disability. So people ask us when we're, when we're evaluating, do we look at them with the hearing aid and see how they function or without, when we're trying to decide if they're a person with a disability? The answer clearly in 2008 was without. You look at them if they're, as if they're not using the hearing aid, as if they're not um, using ordinary eyeglasses, you're allowed to consider. Specialty eyeglasses, you know, really severe pop bottle, you know, for missing a lens or something, yeah, and then you couldn't. Ordinary eyeglasses, that's fine, because we'd all be disabled, you know, <laughs> no. But hearing aids, medication, uh, use of a sign language interpreter, use of specialty techniques for learning disabilities, you don't look at those. 
just when you're deciding if they're a person with a disability or not. Because if you take it into account, you could say, well, with medication, the person with ADHD doesn't have a disability, so we have to do anything. That causes all sorts of discrimination. There were employment cases where an employer didn't want somebody with a hearing aid. With the hearing aid, they were said, well, you, they can hear. They're not disabled, so I can fire them because they have a hearing aid. You know, it just became very strange. So you do not look at mitigating measures just when you're deciding whether or not they're disabled. Consider them without the aids. Now, when you're deciding what they might need, you look at the whole picture because then you do look at what they use. But when you're deciding if they're disabled, you don't look at that stuff. The second thing I wanted to mention was episodic disabilities. If something only flares up now and again, does that mean you're disabled or not? So you have depression, but it's not chronic. It's episodic. The rule is basically when it's active, how impaired are they? So if they're substantially limited at that time, then they're considered a person with a disability, even if it's not all the time. That was for things like epilepsy. All the time, they're not having seizures and stuff, but when they have one, it could be really bad. So they should be considered a person with a disability, and you should know what to do about it when they have one. Makes sense. Okay. A couple of words about IDEA and the difference between IDEA and 504 at this point. Now, we've talked about 504 covers people who have a physical or mental impairment that limits a major life activity substantially. That covers a lot of people. IDEA is different. It defines disability by giving categories of disabilities. It has 13, is it, different types of disability, and you have to fit into one of those boxes. And you have to need special education. So the, the groups overlap, but IDEA, there will be fewer people covered because it has to be one of 13 very specific types of conditions and they have to need special ed. There'll be a lot of people with 504 disabilities that don't need special ed. Diabetes, epilepsy, and most of those people aren't going to need special ed, but they're still disabled. So what districts ask, well, what do I do then? Do I have to do an IDEA evaluation, a 504 evaluation, an IDEA plan, you know, an IEP and a 504 plan? Um, basically, how to handle it is, if someone might qualify under IDEA, evaluate them under IDEA, and if they qualify, serve them under IDEA. But keep in the back of your head that likely they're also protected by Section 504, so there may be some things 504 requires that IDEA doesn't. You don't have to have a separate 504 plan. You have an IDEA. Evaluation, you have an IEP. But if they're also protected, which is probably true, most people with I IEPs would also be protected under Section 504. They may have some additional protections. 504, remember, is an equal opportunity to participate statute. So under IDEA, maybe going on that field trip isn't required for FAPE. You know, they don't need it for a regular, you know, to make progress in their education. But 504, they're also a 504 student, really, they have a disability that qualifies under 504, they then get an equal opportunity to participate, which means they need to go on that field trip. So it may have additional protections. So serve them under IDEA, evaluate them under IDEA, but remember in the back of your head, back of your mind, they're probably a 504 student too, so any equal opportunity sort of issues, any 504 only issues, also will be protected, also will apply. One I can think of specifically is communication. So that um, under Title II, there's a specific provision for communication, that communication has to be with people with disabilities has to be as effective as communication with others. So let's say for, under IDEA, you've got a person with a hearing impairment, and you've decided these particular services will get them regular progress in the curriculum, and that's fine. 504 says equal opportunity to participate, and Title II says communication as effective as. So you may have to do more to make sure their communication is just as good as something else. Maybe IDEA doesn't require it, but 504 does, because equally effective communication. 
So that's where if there's an overlap. The same is not true the other way. Most 504 kids are not necessarily idea kids, but most idea kids will be 504 kids too. 504 is broader, generally. Okay. I get a couple more slides and then Kimberly will be taking over. Um, the next thing you need to decide are what are the child's individual education needs. You look, you look to a variety of sources, such as aptitude or achievement tests, teacher recommendations, physical conditions, social or cultural background, adaptive behavior. Um, the type and amount of information needed is determined by the team. It will vary depending on the nature of the disability. You will evaluate a child with a hearing impairment differently than you evaluate a child with a learning disability. You go based on the type of disability and what the child might need. Um, that is subject to due process, so if you determine you're not, not going to do any testing because we know the parent might challenge you and say you didn't do an adequate evaluation. But that's a team decision. One thing to clarify is medical evaluations. Many districts do not know. If the team decides that you have to have medical information in order to do a proper evaluation, depending on what the condition is, and the parent either doesn't or won't give it to you, but you've determined you have to have it. I mean, there may be that you don't need it. You can do other types of evaluation things that will be fine. But let's say you've, the team really believes they need medical information, and the parent either can't or won't provide it. At that point, the district is responsible for asking the parent permission to get its own medical evaluation and the district that is at the district's expense. So if you need it, which is question number one, then the district is responsible for obtaining the consent and paying for the medical evaluation. You can ask the parent. Many parents will be more than happy to give you their own doctor's information and testing or whatever, but you cannot make the parent do it. If there's testing, that needs to be done, learning disability testing, psychological testing, physical testing, you believe you need it, you are ultimately responsible for getting it. Um, you can't send the parent out and say, well, when you come back with a script that says this child has this disability, then we'll look at it. Now, this is assuming you suspect there's a disability and you really need that information. Okay, questions we'll take at the end, and I'm gonna turn this over to Kimberly at this point. So you have evaluated, you've determined the child has a disability, you've determined what their needs are, and now you have to determine what the placement's going to be. Okay, thanks. I was watching Carla do this and I, I'm like, wholly uncoordinated civil rights attorney, Batman. I hope I do as well as she did <laughs> with these multiple instruments going on here. Okay, so placement, um, placement is essentially the plan. Okay, so, not, so the child's um, eligible, right? And so the child needs services um, to be provided with a FAPE. So the placement is what are we gonna give this kid to make sure they get a FAPE? So placement is, is so it's not just you know, the physical location um, of where the student is, it's, it's everything that the student should be getting. So the legal standard for um, a placement is to ensure that the student gets appropriate educational services designed to meet the student's individual needs as adequately as the needs of students without disabilities are met. I, I wish that was on this slide because that last piece is very important and helpful to know, I think. So that's the standard meets the child's needs as adequately as the needs of students without disabilities are met. So who decides? The team decides, and who constitutes the team? It's a group of persons who are knowledgeable about the student, the meaning of the evaluation data, and the placement options. Parents should be invited to the Section 504 meeting. Unlike IDEA, Section 504 does not require the parent to be a member of the Section 504 team, but for OCR's purposes, when, what we look to see is was the parent provided with a meaningful opportunity to provide input. 
The best way to do that is to invite the parent to the Section 504 meeting. If the parent cannot come or refuses to come, you're trying to schedule a Section 504 meeting, you've given the parent several days and dates and times when a Section 504 meeting could be held and the parent isn't responding, then have your meeting, don't delay, because you are held to time frames under Section 504 to complete, a t not certain time frames, it's a timely evaluation. So you're held to complete timely evaluations, but you can't let the parent hold you up if that's the problem. If you do that, you still must provide the parent with a meaningful opportunity to provide input. So you could offer the parent the opportunity to be on a conference call, you could offer the parent um, the opportunity to provide written information or to provide it before the meeting if they're unable to provide the meeting, uh, attend the meeting, provide it verbally to someone. You just want to document that you've given that parent the meaningful opportunity to provide input. Placement procedures. So the team has to carefully consider the evaluation information from a variety of sources and this includes the parent, again, because that first piece, knowledgeable about the student. You know, your teachers are gonna have information about the student, the aptitude and achievement tests, um, their social um, economic backgrounds, you consider all that, the, all that kind of information. Um, so, but that's why, again, you include the parent to give you information, like for example, like how is the kid doing at school with the homework? You know, you're not gonna have an opportunity for any staff people to see that, so you can't provide that. We see this a lot with ADHD kids. See some kids who are on meds for their ADHD, they do fine during the school day, and then they, you know, about four o'clock, the medication wears off and they kind of crash. They're having to spend a lot of time on their homework, and the parent tells the district this, and the district says, some districts would respond, well, we're not seeing that at school. So we don't think there's a problem. That would be a problematic response from OCR's perspective. Um, so, you know, when you're considering it, it's all the significant factors affecting the student's ability to receive a FAPE. So that includes even things like the, does the student have trouble sleeping? Like what's the sleep hygiene of the student? Um, what, are, do they have kind of, um, any kind of problems or issues at home that are because of their disability that's affecting besides the medication. Again, this is information that you would need from the parent. The team must have document all that information, which is one reason why it's fine to ask the parent for the information in writing. You can't require a parent to provide that, but it, you know that's one means for you all to document that you've gotten this information, you've considered it. You could ask the uh, parent to like send you an email or something with their concerns. The placement options, the team documents all the information considers, does not rely on assumptions regarding persons with the disabilities or um, classes of such persons with disabilities. It's about the individual. Um, like Carla said, just Section 504 is a very individualized process. So districts that have like lists of accommodations to give for certain types of disabilities can sometimes get stuck in the mind frame of that's all you can give. Those kinds of things can be helpful, but we always want to see like an other um, list on that. And I know that OCR is currently working with Columbus City Schools to um, revise Section 504 policies and procedures. So you guys hopefully will have uh, very clear guidance. Um, the written plan should be provided to everyone who will have to implement it. That means teachers, substitute teachers, um, aides. It can mean bus drivers. It can mean cafeteria workers. Some districts seem kind of reticent um, because of privacy concerns to provide that Section 504 plan. But if, if it's a person who's going to implement the plan in any way, the person should have a copy of the plan so that they know what they're supposed to be doing. 
Parents have the right to challenge team decisions, and again, they can either do that in team meetings or they can do it in a more formal process through due process proceedings. So, you know, a, a lot of complaints we get from parents is that they feel um, overwhelmed by districts when the district makes the determination, you know, they kind of feel like they're outnumbered um, because the district usually has a lot of people present because of the requirement, right, that a group of knowledgeable people is involved in making the placement decision. But parents can feel very intimidated by that when they go into a meeting and there are a lot of school staff and only, um, and you know, and it's just them, you all have expertise, knowledge, they don't, may not know some of the terms. So that's why parents have the right to go ahead and challenge the team's decision through due process, which means an independent person would be looking at the decisions of the team, the placement decisions, evaluation decisions, and determining whether or not uh, they were appropriate. Types of academic settings. So it can be regular classes. It can be regular classes with supplementary services, like there can be an aide in the class. There can be adaptive technology, um, like any kind of, even a planner could be adaptive technology, but um, specialized software, you know, any, and that's where a lot of districts get in, in particular universities, um, not so much K through 12, but technology is evolving, adapt, you know, it's coming up so rapidly with different things that you can do. You have to always remember to take into consideration what could this student do if they had this technology. Um, so it's tutors, aides, and adaptive technology, special education. Carla already talked about this. Some districts are um, confused about this. Yes, a 504 kid can get special education. We, you know, I get this question a lot, usually from counselors saying, we think this child needs some special education, but we're being told by our district that they can't get that because they're on a 504 plan and not an IEP. Well, now you have this presentation, you can say, special education is included, or you can have them call us. Um, and related services. So related services can be things like psychological services, counseling services, and also health services. So like Carla was talking about, you know, if a kid has um, type 1 diabetes and they're coming to school and they need their glucose monitored and they need insulin shots, if it's a something health-related that it does not require a physician, then districts are required to provide that service. So a district will have to have, um, if it's what the child needs for FAPE, have as part of the plan that who is gonna be trained, who among the staff is gonna be trained to monitor, monitor the student's glucose levels and to give those insulin shots. Um, Section 504 requires that related services be provided as part of FAPE. So in our mind, the psychological services, the counseling services, insulin shots, those are part of FAPE. And so they should be in a Section 504 plan. The academic setting, so if you're familiar with IDEA, you know, you probably think of this as least restrictive environment, but it's the 504 legal standard, and this is the legal standard, is be educated with non-disabled students to the maximum extent appropriate to the needs of the student with a disability. So the presumption is that the student should be in a regular education classroom unless it, um, an appropriate education cannot be achieved satisfactorily um, with supplementary aids and services in that classroom. And this is looking at the student. Does it, can the student be provided with those? Not the teacher, how much inconvenience it has for the teacher or, or other students. Um, 
academic settings must also be in comparable facilities. This just is talking about is that if the district, well, say that there's a, the district has some buildings that are for some specialized students with disabilities, like that facility itself has to be comparable. And then within the building itself, it has to be comparable. So this is like no, and it really used to be the case, like no dank, dark basements for the kids with disabilities. And the use of trailers is fine, but again, it has to be um, equal. So if the trailers are being used by other kids, like if computer classes are being delivered out there, so there are lots of students kind of rotating in and out of those trailers throughout the day, that would be fine. But just having the kids, only the kids with disabilities in trailers all day long, you know, OCR is going to find that problematic. Okay, so now the kids evaluated, you have your plan, so now you will implement your plan. It's a good practice to have in place something so that you're actually monitoring the implementation of the 504 plan um, because that's where you wouldn't believe, maybe you would, I can't believe sometimes like so many of our complaints for disability are about failure to implement the plan. So that's why I said like at the beginning, it's so important for everyone who's gonna implement the plan to get the plan, have a plan in place for how substitutes, you know, are gonna know about the plan and be able to implement the plan. Um, it's just, it's really important. It's gonna save you some hassle down the road. Reevaluation. So section 504 does re require reevaluations, not as often as idea. So, when it's periodically, um, which is not defined by 504 of the regulations, and it's before a significant change in placement, which are also not defined by the regulations. So OCR says, so periodically, essentially, you know, when you would evaluate a kid periodically is when the kid is having some kind of learning or behavior difficulty that's impacting their ability to receive FAPE. Um, so you see that they're having some troubles. That means maybe there's a disability that hasn't been diagnosed yet, or maybe it's that there's a problem with the plan or that students' needs have changed. So if you think that the student is now not receiving FAPE for any of those reasons, then the Section 504 team should be reconvened and the student should be reevaluated. Before a significant change in placement, that really means a significant change in placement is any significant change in the amount or type of services that the student is receiving. It's not um, like a change in teachers, like who are providing the same services. You know, like the kid doesn't have to get a new 504 plan just because they're going into a new grade. It's only if the services are going to be required would they need to have a, um, a reevaluation. Okay, so Section 504 and IDEA are somewhat different with regards to discipline. So there's some misconceptions about discipline. And so I would say, uh, let me say, we're kind of moving. So now we've done identification, evaluation, placement. And so now we're kind of talking about other issues, right? So we're, tra we're transitioning, even though we, the slide doesn't tell you that. Students, without disabil students with disabilities cannot be disciplined. People think that, that is wrong. Students with disabilities can be disciplined. Students with disabilities have no special protections regarding discipline. That's also wrong. They do have special protections regarding discipline. Um, disciplinary excuse, exclusion, it may result in a significant change in placement, triggering in, in the need for reevaluation. For today's purposes, um, all I'm really going to say about that is, is that if it's 10 or fewer days, then there's no need to reevaluate. If it's 11 days or more, you want to hold a manifestation determination, which is really a re, like an evaluation to determine was the student's behavior that resulted in the discipline a manifestation of the student's disability. So for the 11 or more days rule, it can be 11 or more days, like in one shot, the kid does something once and like suspension is, or excuse me, expulsion is proposed, 
or it could be 11 or more days in the aggregate. So when you're considering, so the kid has two suspension, three suspension, two days, three days, you know, five days, and it's, you're gonna get to day 11. So then, to decide whether or not a manifestation determination should be held, you look at um, how, how many incidents has the child had of the behavior that resulted in the suspension. Were those behaviors related behaviors so that you think that they were similar enough that it could have been a manifestation of um, the disability? Um, were, you know, like impulse control. So it doesn't have to be the same thing, but does the, the action the student took indicate um, that it could be related to the student's disability? If you believe that the 11 or more days um, aggregate are going to result in or a possible manifestation because you've looked at, wow, he's done this and this and this, and these all, he's done them in a relative, you know, a two month period of time. They're all kind of similar, show impulse control. Then you need to go ahead and have a manifestation determination before you suspend the student, before you suspend the student for day 11. Procedural safeguards. So, Student, this is due process. Procedural safeguards are due process. So still, school districts must have due process for procedures so that parents can challenge the team's decisions regarding identification, evaluation, placement. So um, there's gonna be separate, and in a minute I'll talk about grievance procedures. One thing we commonly OCR commonly helps districts with is to develop policies and procedures and a lot of districts we make we, we like to make sure that the identification evaluation placement procedures have one um, due process procedure and then a grievance process which is really disability straight up disability discrimination has a separate procedure um, so that the parents can challenge actions taken by the school district so procedural safeguards include notice, a records review by the parent, um, impartial hearing with participation by the parent and counselor, a review procedure. All of these things must be in place um, to, for OCR to consider it a fair and impartial due process hearing. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about common compliance concerns with delivering FAPE. So this is again, you know, you, this student is qualified. So things that OCR often sees are making decisions unilaterally instead of by the team. This is one reason why it's so important to get kids identified as students with disabilities. So like, for example, a, a kid with a peanut allergy that rises to the level of a physical or mental impairment that substantially impacts a major life activity. Like that kid, we would want to make sure that kid was evaluated under Section 504 because once a plan is put into place, no one can just unilaterally change the plan without to make a, it a significant change in placement without a reevaluation. I mentioned that example because we see it a lot because kids with peanut allergies they often have um, they often have. Other parents, we see a lot of times where other parents complain, you know, about some of the steps that have to be taken for, you know, the kids can't have peanuts, my son's a vegetarian, I can relate, like I need to send peanut butter, but you know, it's a kid with a life-threatening allergy, so you gotta take it seriously, you can't just be making changes. Making decisions that are not based on evaluation or child, the child's needs, and like Carla said, where I would say we see that the most is the district just does whatever the parent wants rather than, whether, what, rather than on what the team thinks is appropriate for FAPE. Failure to implement the IEP or 504 plan and then not affording the parents procedural safeguards. See, I'm sorry, I told you I can't do too many things at once. Other responsibilities. Okay, extracurricular and other non-academic activities. Students with disabilities must be allowed to participate 
um, must provide an equal opportunity to participate in transportation, lunch, recess, physical, physical education, clubs, athletics, et cetera. It may be part of the Section 504 plan. Again, it's a good idea to think through when you're doing a plan, like what do we, so sometimes that everyday kind of stuff is the easier stuff to deal with, but then remember to ask yourself like, what else do we do? Like these, you know, few times a year, what else is it that we do that we gotta think about the needs of this kid for? Cause you know, you got a lot going on, you just forget about it, but just, you know, try and make that part of your process. Okay, discrimination under Section 504 in Title II. So denial of a FAPE is only one form. Um, there's others that OCR would investigate uh, if a student is uh, treated differently or there's um, an impact, a different impact on students with disabilities because of a district's policy or procedure. Uh, disability harassment, this includes bullying. For OCR's purposes though, so harassment, and this is any harassment, it's sex harassment, racial harassment, disability harassment. It has to be um, actions or words that are so uh, severe, persistent, or pervasive that they create a hostile environment so that the student's ability to participate in the district's educational program is impacted significantly. Okay, so that's a mouthful, but hostile environment. It has to be severe, persistent, or pervasive. Like one time is probably not going to be enough. All right, a district must also... So the, a district must also have a 504 coordinator. Um, so the 504 coordinator is supposed to coordinate the district's activities under Section 504. Um, and the 504 coordinator's name has to be, their, their title and contact information has to be published somewhere um, in district publications on the district's website so that if, if someone has 504 concerns, they know who the correct person is. Like, I'm sometimes surprised when we interview uh, teachers and other staff as part of a, an investigation of discrimination, how often when we ask who is your Section 504 coordinator, people don't know. So if you don't know who your district's Section 504 coordinator is, please find out, okay, their name and their, and sometimes, you know, with, I don't know if Columbus does or not. I don't know how well they publish this. It's not a comment on Columbus. This is an overall comment. But a lot of times you see large districts have building 504 coordinators as well as district section 504 coordinators. Okay, like we talked about, I talked about briefly, grievances. District has to establish grievance procedures for resolving complaints. They have to provide a prompt and equitable process. I could talk for a long time about grievance procedures, but I won't, um, besides designating their 504 coordinator. Districts may not retaliate. So that means intimidate, threaten, coerce, or discriminate against individuals because they have asserted their rights under Section 504, Title II. So say in a meeting, a parent is advocating for their student and saying, I think my student, not, so my student has a disability and they need this and this and this. And they're contacting the teachers and they're contacting other staff members. Um, so that's, OCR would consider that advocacy under Section 504 in Title II. And so if the district takes any retaliatory action against them, that in itself is prohibited by Section 504. So under the legal definition of um, retaliation, so an adverse action is taken because of a protected activity. So it has to be taken, um, because the person engaged in that activity. You know, if the district has taken the action for other reasons, then that's just part of what OCR looks at in its investigation to determine whether or not an action was retaliatory. Um, if a person opposes disability discrimination, I have a case right now, a teacher was 
terminated because she advocated on behalf of her students with disabilities because they weren't getting the services that they needed and the district fired her. So she's a pretty good claim with us. Um, participated in a complaint process or hearing. So even if like a teacher um, or other staff member, say OCR is investigating and we interview staff as part of that process and the employee decides that a district person can um, be present during the interview and then the district takes an adverse action because of that retaliation, because of that participation, they don't like what the person said during the interview, that in itself is a violation of Section 504. Okay, so the result for all of this, just like any of our civil rights laws, is supposed to be equal opportunity. It's equal opportunity for students with disabilities to participate in the district's educational program and services. And you have our, in your handout, you also have um, our contact information. One of the things we do besides coming out and giving TA presentations like this, technical assistance presentations, is we take phone calls. So we cannot answer a specific question on a specific case um, you're, if you're calling us about a specific situation. But if you have a general legal question, we are more than happy to answer that. Okay, so that's gonna end our presentation. Thank you very much.